Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to this scientist.com and Express Cells webinar titled Creating Better Gene Edited Cell Lines with the Fast HDR System. I'm Liam Sanyo from the events team here at scientist.com, and I'll be your host today. We're being joined by Dr. Oscar Perez Leal, co founder of Express Cells and assistant professor in the pharmaceutical sciences department at the Temple University School of Pharmacy, and Dr. John, John Whiteants. Associate Vice President for Research and also Professor at the College of Nursing and Health Innovation at the University of Texas at Arlington. Today, the speakers are going to give an overview of uh, the Express Cells Fast HDR system to generate custom gene edited cell lines and present case studies highlighting several applications. Uh, and with that, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Oscar Perez Leal. Oscar, thanks so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you, Lian, for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to present my research on this webinar. Before starting, I have to mention that I am the co-founder of Express Cells, a company that generates and commercializes cell lines developed with the FastHDR technology that I'm going to talk to you about today here in this presentation. The drug discovery process, as many of you are aware, is really long and complex and expensive. Um, particularly, the first years of the drug discovery process relies heavily on the use of in vitro assays that more commonly use cell lines and cell technology assays to do the initial characterization of compounds. Specifically, let me show you what we do there. So at the beginning, of a drug discovery process, we rely heavily on the use of cell lines to identify and validate targets, to develop assays for high throughput screening, and to identify hits and to optimize leads in order to move those compounds into animal models to do preclinical studies and eventually to do clinical research. But recently, the use of cells have become more important with the recent development in organoid technology and 3D models and organ on a chip technologies that are facilitating the simulation of human diseases or human tissues in in vitro conditions in a more better way than animal models sometimes in order to accelerate the process of drug discovery in order to move compounds faster from labs into clinical research. One of the techniques that is really allowing us to explore cell models like never before is the technique called high content imaging, which is a microscopy technique that use very sophisticated microscopes that are autonomous in a way that they can automatically take thousands of images from plates that are treated with compounds and in combination with very powerful data analysis software packages that can analyze of these images we can extract really comprehensive information of the cells and the structures and the targets and how the cells are being affected by those compounds that we are using in our um, screenings but high content imaging have certain limitations. So for example, high content imaging requires um, to do cell fixing most of the time. So it is difficult working with live cells sometimes. Also depends heavily on the availability of very good antibodies that will not generate false signals. And these uh, two limitations basically make difficult sometimes to use high content imaging to work with live cells. So the access to genome engineering with CRISPR technology around 10 years ago started to change this because for the first time it was possible to do genomic modifications in live cells in order to create um, cell models or cell lines that have new capabilities to do drug discovery. In very simple terms, CRISPR is an enzyme 
that can go to a specific regions in the genome of a cell thanks to an RNA molecule called a uh, guide RNA or sgRNA. And this guide RNA allows the protein to identify a specific sequence that can be then cut by the CRISPR protein and generate a double-stranded break. And this type of DNA damage uh, will be detected by the cell machinery and will be repaired as soon as possible. So the cell has basically two options to repair this damage done by CRISPR. If we only provide the cell with CRISPR and the sgRNA, the cut will be more than likely replaced uh, or repaired with a non-homologous end joining approach in which the two ends of the DNA will be connected. But in order to do this, the enzymes that participate in the reaction, they must either insert or remove nucleotides around the cut area in order to join the DNA. So if this region contains information of a protein coding gene, the sequence of that gene will be damaged, and more than likely, the protein will not be functional. So this is a good approach if we want to damage a protein in order to generate gene knockouts. Alternatively, if we provide the cell with a piece of DNA that resembles the borders around the cut with uh, arms of DNA, this donor DNA can be used to uh, repair the cut without leaving a scar and without leaving any, any uh, missing piece in the information. So we can also take advantage of this moment to include additional information in between these arms to insert new genetic information at the cutting site. So this process has been highly useful for inserting fluorescent proteins into proteins of interest in the genome of a cell. So now when the cell produces a protein, it will come naturally labeled with a fluorescent protein. And I have here um, a question for the audience. Um, what type of gene editing are you most interested in performing in your experiments? So CRISPR gene tagging opened new possibilities for executing high content imaging experiments. So instead of the traditional method that relies heavily on working with fixed cells and dead cells, you can imagine working with cell models where your endogenous targets are naturally labeled and you can track these targets, see what happened to your cells and execute live cell analysis without the use of antibodies or stainings. But despite the availability of these methodologies for some time now, is a um, approach that is not widely used, mostly because the insertion of these large tags or the development of cells with this type of modifications is a slow and complex. And basically, that happened for two main reasons. The first one is that creating the genetic components that are used for these modifications is highly time consuming and requires expertise. And also, the process of inserting these genomic modifications with CRISPR is not naturally efficient. So a big amount of time has to be invested in trying to eliminate the cells that were not modified in the reaction. And let me explain you more in detail why is that. So traditionally, the creation of these donor templates that will contain the information of the fluorescent protein that is going to be inserted takes multiple weeks and require expertise. And once you have those elements and you put them into cells via transfection or electroporation, not all the cells will get the genetic modification that you want. And it's expected that between one to 30% of the cell can get the modification depending on the cell type. So a big amount of time has to be put to use methodologies that will help you to isolate pure modified cells. And that can take multiple, multiple weeks. So we saw an opportunity here to create a new type of donor vector that will try to avoid these major hurdles. Our approach was to develop a plasmid system for homologous donor recombination that was easy to assemble in a single reaction instead of requiring multiple steps. Also, the vector contained 
the modules for for the uh, tags that are going to be included into the genes of interest are easily replaceable and also we include antibiotic selection genes that can be only expressed if the genetic insertion occurs at the desired genomic region. So what this translates into is that now we can assemble these vectors in only one day and once we put this into cells we can start selecting those cells around three days later and in a matter of a few more days we can verify by microscopy that our cells got the modification something that is much faster with this methodology than traditional methods but how efficient is the fast hdr system so we have seen in our um, experience that it ranges according to the cell type and in this experiment here in the screen with hec 93 t cells we can see that for two of the targets that i'm going to show you later we see uh, a range in the modification of you know between 30 to 40 percent of the cells are receiving the the genetic integration of the modification and this is before antibiotic selection and once we uh, select the positive cells with antibiotics in a matter of five days we increase the population of modifying cells to more than 98 percent of the cells having the, the desired genetic modification Here are some examples of cells that we have created with the FASTHDR system that contain multiple tags and multiple antibiotics for selection of the modified cells. And we have cells labeled with M clover 3 at beta tubulin, M ruby 3 that is a red protein in histone 3, and a blue fluorescent protein in a mitochondrial protein. But the key um, advantage of the FASTHDR system is that for the first time we can combine all these plasmids in a single reaction and modify three genes at the same time and develop multiplex um, genome edited cells like the ones you see here in the screen. I want to highlight that these cells that you are seeing are alive and we can track all the processes and all the um, cell cycle events that are happening to the cells that you can see in the pictures on the right. So this methodology allows you for the first time to track multiple targets and to develop really um, powerful models to do drug discovery without having to rely on any staining or antibodies. Here's an example of a cell model that we use to explore what happens when you treat cells with a compound that induce apoptosis? You can see how the treated cells quickly stop dividing and they start losing body mass while the untreated cells continue happily dividing. Here we have another example of cells that were treated with a compound that stabilized microtubules. And you can see how the treated cells enter into mitosis and they cannot exit mitosis because tubulin is essential to complete that process and tubulin is being inhibited in these cells and these cells eventually will go into uh, die from apoptosis as well we reported the fast hdr technology in the crispr journal last year on december and we were featured on the cover of that um, month due to our capability to do this multiplex gene tagging with CRISPR. And the reference is here at the bottom. So now I'm gonna show you some examples of projects where we have used modified cells with this technology to study the function of proteins or to discover compounds that have specific uh, biological activities. We wanted to alter the process that is more commonly used to perform high content imaging and this process normally start with uh, treated cells that have to be fixed then you have to go through all these steps to add antibodies and perform watches in between a process that is highly laborious and expensive we wanted to replace this with a, an approach where we will have genetically edited cells that we will treat with our compounds or proteins to immediately evaluate by cell microscopy and here I also want to 
ask the audience for another question about what type of cells would you like to use for gene editing? The first model that we develop is a cell line that is good to identify autophagy inhibitors. And autophagy is a physiological process that cells uses for recycling all proteins and autophagy is affected in multiple diseases, is important for cancer cells. So there is a lot of interest in the community to identify new autophagy inhibitors because this could become potential anti-cancer drugs. So in order to develop this model, we label a protein called P62, which is a, an autophagy receptor protein with a fluorescent protein. And in the same cell line, we label two other proteins to do cellular segmentation. So one protein um, was histone 1 that was labeled with a blue fluorescent protein and allows us to discover where the nuclei is. And another protein was tubulin to discover where the cytoplasm boundaries are in these cells. And we use HeLa cells for building this model. In these cells, if you use an autophagy inhibitor such as hydroxychloroquine, you can see how after treatment, the cells um, not only accumulate more autophagy vesicles, but also the intensity of those vesicles increase uh, due to the, the inhibition of autophagy. But autophagy is also um, used by the cell when the cells are under viral infection. So it's a mechanism that also can help mammalian cells to eliminate viral proteins and to prevent viral particle formation. So naturally, some viruses have evolved proteins in their genome that can inhibit this physiological autophagy. So um, inhibiting autophagy can reduce antigen presentation to the immune system and help the virus to continue dividing inside an infected cell. So when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started, we immediately got interested in exploring if the genome of the COVID-19 uh, virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, was um, having uh, a protein with these capabilities to inhibit autophagy. In order to study that, we took advantage of this uh, report that analyzed the protein-protein interaction between all the theoretical proteins present in the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and human proteins in the HEC-293 T cell. And we analyzed the data and extracted the viral proteins that were mainly interacting with human proteins that were located in vesicles. So we identified these seven proteins in our initial analysis and our approach was to build overexpression plasmids to overexpress each of these proteins uh, with a fluorescent protein at the C-terminal tag that will not interfere with the other fluorescent proteins that will not cross tag with the other proteins already present in the cell model. Once we created these plasmids, the plan was to transfect the cells and at the same time plate the cells in a 384 plate format and 14 hours later we started acquiring images in four channels every hour during 24 hours to quantitate changes in the autophagy vesicles in these transfected cells. So here is an example of how those cells look after those first 14 hours after transfection. And you can see that not all the cells in the population are overexpressing the recombinant protein. So we built an image analysis um, setup that will allow us to specifically identify changes in cells that were expressing the recombinant proteins versus cells that were not expressing the recombinant proteins. And let me show you how that works. So in this slide, I show you how initially we will use the histone labeling to detect the nuclei of every cell, every cell in the image. Then we will use the beta tubulin labeling to define the cytoplasm boundaries of each cell that was identified in the previous image. And then we will identify the cells that were overexpressing the recombinant protein in the image and cells that were not overexpressing the recombinant protein 
then we will independently analyze the characteristics of the autophagic vesicles in cells overexpressing the recombinant proteins versus cells that were not overexpressing the protein. So each image has its own control inside the same picture. So the microscope took uh, thousands of pictures independently over uh, 24 hours. We tracked the cells every hour during 24 hours. And when we did the ratio of um, signal intensity for all these proteins, we noticed that for only one protein, there was a statistically significant change, and that protein was called ORF3A. We can see how over time the signal intensity increase in cells that are overexpressing the recombinant protein versus cells that are not. And if you compare that against also the cells that were only expressing the fluorescent protein RFP670, we can see how clearly the cells that are overexpressing the ORF3A protein accumulate large amounts of these autophagy vesicles, suggesting that this is an autophagy inhibitor. Because these cells are alive during the whole process, we can take images uh, more rapidly instead of every hour, and we can build uh, very uh, powerful time lapses to visualize this process. So you can see here how the cells that are overexpressing the recombinant viral protein accumulate more of these autophagic vesicles. Our findings were also corroborated during the time that the article was uh, under review by the publication of other two groups that identify ORF3A as an autophagy inhibitor protein, and they use alternative uh, methodologies that, that complement um, the work that we did. Now, I want to switch gears to talk about another application. And we also use these cell models to study the microtubule dynamics. Microtubules are essential for maintaining cellular shape and for segregating the chromosomes during cell division. So the microtubules have been um, a good target for developing novel anti-cancer drugs. So we wanted to explore if these cells were good to do live cell analysis to detect novel microtubule uh, polymerization inhibitors. Traditionally, the identification of compounds that alter microtubule polymerization or microtubule depolymerization involve the use of biochemical assays that require pure tubulin. So there are not cells in the assay, just tubulin. If you want to do imaging of cells that are being treated with these compounds, you have to do self-fixing and immunofluorescence in most cases. So we wanted to try an alternative methodology just using live cells. One of the first experiments that we did was to use non-tubulin polymerization inhibitors to treat these cells to evaluate what changes were identified in the tubulin pattern. And we were able to see how cells treated with non-tubulin polymerization inhibitors lose that fiber-like pattern of the tubulin um, made the image look more homogeneous. So more importantly, we wanted to know if these changes were also um, detectable by the software in the, in the microscope. So in order to evaluate that, we developed uh, an image analysis process to quantitate that. In this image analysis, we basically initially identify the nuclei to identify every cell, and then we identify the cytoplasm of every cell by using the tubulin labeling, and then we analyze the texture properties of the cytoplasm of every cell in the image by using different algorithms that were included in the software that came with the microscope. This microscope is a Perkin-Elmer Operetta CLS, and it comes with Harmony software. One of the parameters that definitely changes when the tubulin uh, polymerization is inhibited is this Harley texture homogeneity. So this is an algorithm that measures how homogeneous an image is. And you can see how the values for the texture homogeneity are lower when the cells have the normal uh, tubulin polymerization pattern. 
But as soon as you inhibit tubulin polymerization, the values increase, and these numbers are statistically significant. So we immediately consider doing a compound screening with a small library to um, prove that we were able to identify novel tubulin polymerization inhibitors with these cells and with this approach. For this experiment, we basically took the cells, played the cells in a 384 well plate. The next day, we treat the cells with a kinase inhibitor library containing 429 compounds. And 24 hours later, we image the cells and we did analysis of those images to determine the Haralik homogeneity values in every image, in every well. Then we determined the cutoff to identify potential positive hits, and that cutoff was the mean plus three standard deviations of the Haralik homogeneity value as the, the limit to look for uh, compounds that were about that limit. And we were able to identify three compounds that were above the limit. Then we proceed to obtain fresh compounds from different providers to repeat these experiments and to test this in more detail in a dose uh, response experiment. And we tested the compounds in a range between 1 nanomolar and 4,000 nanomolar. And here we only have images presenting, um, representing from untreated cells to 2,000 nanomolar. And we were able to confirm that all the compounds can inhibit tubular polymerization indeed, as uh, colchicine can do, but not all compounds have the same potency to do this. So we determined by using the Haralik texture homogeneity values, the IC50 for tubular polymerization inhibition. Uh, basically, we were trying to identify what would be the optimal concentration of compound to start seeing uh, depolymerization in treated cells and we noticed that a colchicine is the most potent compound followed by KX2391 and ON1910 after that. This is not an IC50 to um, evaluate cell growth, it's just to evaluate the phenotypic changes in tubulin polymerization. Because we study this process in a range of um, 24 hours, we noticed that most of the changes were happening in the first three hours of treatment. So we concentrate on studying those first three hours in more detail. To do that, basically we decided to study the cells every three minutes to acquire these images. And we can see how after treating the cells that is represented by the red arrow, the Haralik texture homogeneity values start increasing rapidly and most of the changes occurs in the first 20 minutes. So this tubulin polymerization process occurs really rapidly and we can detect this really rapidly because we have these live cells that allow us to um, evaluate this immediately without having to do any staining. We can also put these images in a video and you can evidence yourself how the compounds basically immediately remove the normal tubulin um, microtubule pattern in the cytoplasm of these cells. So these compounds are indeed uh, tubulin polymerization inhibitors. So what kind of things can you do with cells developed with FASHDR system? So there are multiple applications and we are highlighting here the most important ones. So one of the best applications is to do high content imaging with this type of cells to avoid the use of antibodies or staining and to track your endogenous targets for your um, studies. You can also do live tracking of endogenous targets, live cells imaging. You can study the mechanism of actions of novel compounds. And in this presentation, we only show you uh, cell models that have been built with fluorescent proteins, but we have created other models using other tags, such as luciferases, different purification tags, degradation tags, tags that are used for uh, studying protein-protein interactions. So the FASHDR system allows us to put any type of protein tag into uh, cells of interest. 
the main limitations of the system are that the cell selection require an active expression of the endogenous target that you want to modify. So if you are trying to modify a protein that is not expressed during uh, the whole lifetime of a cell or a protein that is only present when it's induced by a factor, those um, are going to be more difficult to be um, modified with this, with this system because you, you're going to have a hard time selecting for the modified cells. The cell type that you are going to use must be a good, good host for receiving DNA via transfection or extrapolation. And also, there is a, a general limitation that applies to any type of, of CRISPR approach, which is that your gene target must have good um, CRISPR recognition sites that are unique. So you reduce the chance of um, allowing CRISPR to cut in other regions of the DNA that you don't want to modify. And I want to ask you here uh, a question. Um, how do you plan to attain your gene edited cells in the near future? With this, I want to finish and I want to thank the people in my lab, particularly Haryutun Kachatrian that did the work on tubulin and my collaborators at the Mulder Center for Drug Discovery at Temple University and the Fox Chase Cancer Center and my funding sources. Finally, I want to thank you for your attention and we are uh, open to have some questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Oscar, for a great presentation. Uh, for this next part of the webinar, we'll do things a bit differently here. Uh, instead of John giving a standard presentation, uh, instead we sat down with him last week to record an interview to ask a few questions about his own experiences using uh, custom cell lines for his work with Abexa. Uh, so here's that video now. Um, okay, so with all that said, John, you ready to answer a few questions here? I sure am, Liam. All righty then. Um, so to start off, uh, maybe you could just tell us a bit about yourself uh, and your company. Okay. Well, I'll start with my current position. I, I currently serve as, as an Associate Vice President for Research at the University of Texas at Arlington, as well as I hold the uh, rank of Professor in the College of Nursing and Health Innovation and in, in the College of Engineering. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a background, uh, how I got started on this path of, of, of building biotech companies. I, I, I took my PhD in, micro, in um, molecular biology immunology at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. And from there, I went and, and did a postdoc in industry. And at that point in time, I, I, I came across several like-minded um, entrepreneurs um, that, and, and from there, we formed um, a company first biotech company that really was doing cutting edge research on developing novel immunotherapeutics for cancer. And that sort of then led me on a journey throughout my career of building biotech companies with the, the last biotech company being Abexa Biologics. Uh, that company, I served as co-founder and CSO. That company was acquired by Berger Engelheim at the end of last year. Excellent, well, it's uh, great to have you with us. Um... So moving on, what was the project uh, that you needed the gene edited cells for? Um, and why did you need the cells to be uh, gene edited? Yes. Um, so my work over the years has in the company of Exa Biologics focus is really around um, a target or class of um, molecules known as the major histocompatibility complexes, MHC, or uh, human leukocyte antigens in humans, HLA. And these proteins um, present, and they're really, to keep it simple here, there, there are two classes of MHC molecules, MHC class, class one and MHC class two. And both of these types of molecules present peptides that are derived from processed proteins. And so MHC class one molecules load peptides that range between eight and 11 amino acids. Um, and in length, and MHC class two molecules present peptides that um, have a length between 12 and 20 amino acids. And these molecules take these peptides, they go to the surface of a cell, and they present um, the peptide and the MHC complex to T cells. MHC1 uh, peptide complexes are presented to CD8 positive T cells. MHC class two plus peptide are presented to CD4 positive T cells. 
So my, my, my area of, of research and expertise and the focus of ABEXA biologics uh, 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 technology has was, was really been focused around developing antibodies uh, to, that can target peptide HLA complexes that are expressed on cancer cells. Now, in these, this particular situation, the tumor cell presents a peptide, again, between 8 and 11 amino acids in length, via an, an MHC class 1 molecule on its surface. The peptide that's presented is hopefully uh, specific to the cancer cell. And what Abexa Biologic uh, worked on was developing uh, a platform to raise antibodies that, that uh, we call T-cell receptor-like antibodies uh, or TCR-like antibodies that, had, that could then recognize the peptide in the complex of the MHC1 molecule as shown here. And so why is there an interest in, in, in targeting or making these types of antibodies? Well, they have, they're being developed not just by ABEXA, but by other groups now for uh, use in, in research purposes to understand, to, to better understand how proteins are processed and, and, and peptides get loaded uh, by healthy cells, as well as obviously disease cells, viral infected cells and tumor cells. They're being developed for diagnostic purposes, uh, but for, from a BEX's um, um, uh, perspective, these types of antibodies um, are being developed for therapeutic purposes. And they're being, once they're made, they're formatted into either bispecific T cell engagers, or they can be made as chimeric engine receptors to create CAR T cells, or they can be developed into um, antibody drug conjugates. So when you make an antibody, a TCR-like antibody, it's very important to be able to demonstrate conclusively that the binding is highly selective for the HLA or the MHC class 1 molecule with the, the peptide of interest, okay? And so what I'm showing in this slide here um, is that there are four different cells, cancer cells, but only one of the, one of the cancer cells is expressing the correct peptide. This red ball here represents the peptide and the TCR-like antibody that I'm, I'm highlighting here recognizes only that peptide in the context of the MHC class 1 molecule. So that this would allow then that antibody to recognize the tumor cell. And if the TCR-like antibody was properly uh, weaponized, uh, it could then seek out and destroy this particular cancer cell. And it wouldn't be able to recognize the other uh, cancer cells that are drawn here because they're presenting a different peptide, which is represented by a, the, 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 the circle in a different color. So what we wanted to do was um, to, <clears throat> so that we could, we could uh, fully evaluate the binding selectivity of, of, of one of our T-cell receptor-like antibodies, we wanted to <clears throat> work with express cells and use their, their fast homology-directed repair system technology to make a single amino acid mutation in the peptide of interest. And this would allow us to demonstrate fine specificity, fine binding specificity of, of the TCR-like antibody uh, of interest. And so what we have in this slide here is we have an example of, of the actual specific mutation that we wanted express cells to, to make for us. Um, so here again, we have, we have the T cell receptor-like antibody. It sees the red circle, which is the peptide loaded into MHC class one that's being expressed or displayed on the surface of a tumor cell. Okay. And if you look below um, where I'm drawing here, um, there's, um, there's a sequence of, of amino acids that starts with a valine and ends with a, a, leuc a leucine. And that represents nine amino acids. So these amino acids that, uh, the, the, this, 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 this string of amino acids is actually processed as a single peptide and it gets loaded into the MHC class one molecule. And that's represented again by the red dot here. What I've got highlighted in this sequence is, is, and it's highlighted in green, is a phenylalanine. That's, that's, that's the F. Um, that's the residue that we wanted to mutate. And we wanted to mutate it so that it would be um, uh, shown over here. It would be, it would be mutated to a valine. 
okay? And the we know that if we make this peptide um, with the mutation of valine in position eight, and we load it into the MHC molecule, the, the TCR-like antibody uh, does not bind to it. And so what we wanted to do is to prove that in a cell system, that this, that this observation that we made uh, in, 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 in a, a recombinant protein uh, model, we wanted to demonstrate it uh, using tumor cells. And so we wanted to use this knock-in approach that, that's uh, the technology of express cells to actually introduce this single uh, amino acid mutation into this stretch of the, the protein so that the peptide that would be processed would then be loaded into uh, the MHC1. And then we could demonstrate, hopefully demonstrate then that the TCR-like antibody that were, that Abexa was interested in moving forward and, and, and its development program uh, would not recognize it. And so that's the reason why we went to express cells uh, to, to take advantage uh, and to work with them uh, on using their fast HDR uh, technology. Fantastic. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so why didn't you try to do the gene editing yourself then? Yeah, great question. Um, well, it um, really stems from the fact that, that my team uh, at that time uh, really didn't have the experience or expertise to perform these types of knock-ins. Uh, these are very, very difficult types of knock-ins to, to, to get to work. And we just didn't have, you know, at that time didn't have that kind of expertise. Um, and, you know, the other thing that we didn't really have is the sort of the, the expertise in designing, uh, not only performing these types of knock-ins, but actually designing the constructs in the right way. Uh, and, and, and because this is a, a homologous recombination sort of event, um, it takes a certain level of expertise that, again, uh, my team um, didn't have at that time. Um, and so, you know, we searched um, around for a vendor or different vendors that that might have that kind of expertise and and that's really how we came uh, uh to find express cells uh because they had the the technology and expertise to to do these types of mutations yeah great point um so john did you consider any other approaches or suppliers uh, like what let you led you to select uh, specifically express cells in their fast hdr system yeah so um we did look at um other vendors and we we also looked at other approaches and in fact um in terms of other approaches we we also plan to work with um um uh, well characterized cell lines um to knock in the genes for the hla as well as the antigen g gene and so there was this other approach where we would actually knock in the entire gene um, so we'd work with a cell line that that didn't have the endogenous gene. So it, it, it didn't have antigen G. It didn't have the particular HLA allele either. And so we, we thought, well, maybe that would be a simpler approach where we would take sort of a null cell um, that lacked these different genes and we would just knock in the whole gene. Um, but at the same time, we felt that, um, that the more... Um, sophisticated way to create an isogenic cell line would be uh, if we could modify the target peptide um, by the approach that I just described, which would be mutating a single amino acid residue within that stretch of amino acids, which, which would make up the peptide. Uh, and we felt that, that would be the best way to demonstrate uh, binding selectivity of the TCR-like antibody. We did look at other vendors, uh, as I said in, uh, just a minute ago. Um, and again, we, we selected Express Cells really because of their fast homology directed repair technology and the expertise. It's not like they just developed the technology. They had um, um, examples of, of success stories of, of it working. And we just felt very confident uh, that we were in good hands um, working with the Express Cells team. Uh, additionally, we were impressed with you know the technology and what it can do, but it, we were also very much impressed with the speed at which uh, these types of knock-in mutations could be done. Uh, we 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 were told that the um, 
knock-ins could be done within days, whereas many of the other vendors we talked to were talking uh, about weeks, if not if not months. And so, so that made it kind of easy. It was almost a no-brainer because we liked the technology, we liked the team, they had the expertise, and they're telling us that. Um, and they had examples again to back it up that they could do these types of this kind of work within days as opposed to weeks or months. I think the other thing too was you would you probably would wonder about the cost. You know, if they can be that uh, quick and and this technology is is um, is is has great great you know has many strengths compared to the competitors that perhaps it would be just unreasonably expensive and and to use their their services and, and and in fact it was the opposite there with the prices that they quoted us uh, to do the type of work um, that we needed done were com were very competitive with what the other vendors were quoting us so again we 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 decided that with all those that all the information that we gathered that express sales was was a vendor to go to go to for this project yeah it's all great to hear uh, very high praise. Love to hear it. Um, so shifting gears a bit, uh, we were talking a bit before the webinar, and uh, I understand that there were some challenges uh, in your project. So, uh, John, could you just tell us a bit more about those issues that you ran into and uh, how you worked with Express Cells to address them? Yeah. Yeah. So as I said um, just moments ago, that this this was, um, you know, we thought that this would be a challenge project and 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 the scientists at Express Cells agreed with us. They thought that this would be um a challenging project as well uh but it was challenging not because of that the technology uh would be limiting the challenges really stemmed um from the the fact that the cell lines that we abexa wanted to use uh that we wanted to modify with this single amino acid mutation had not been worked um on previously by express cells nor my team had we had no prior experience uh, doing anything you know any kind of uh, uh, knock in or knock out work with these cell lines and so we we learned that the, one of the biggest challenges that that express cells uh, the scientists there faced was that the cells that we selected the tumor cells lines that we selected um, had very slow doubling times uh, the one cell line took um, three to four days to double. And so that presented a challenge for the, the Express Cells team uh, to, to, to work with cell lines that, that grew that slow. The other challenge, and again, we had again, no prior experience working with the three cell lines we selected, um, that, that they, we, there was no data um, that we had or that we could find from the literature uh, showing how well these cell lines could be transfected. Uh, Express Cells, the scientists at Express Cells uh, used two approaches to deliver the genes, the mutations, um, and um, they used electroporation. And they quickly learned that uh, after two or three or four attempts with each of the cell lines, uh, they, they, the efficiency of transfection uh, via electroporation and obviously uh, various modifications to the electroporation uh, process were done, but they, but the efficiency of transfection was very poor. And as a backup, what Express Cells tried, and they, and they do this routinely if, if electroporation doesn't, doesn't work well, they uh, utilize a number of uh, lipofection reagents, so a different approach, it's, it's um, electroporation. But again, the transfection efficiency remained quite low. I believe it was less than 10%. And um, the uh, and ultimately um, um, because of the low uh, transfection efficiency, um, the the we, we failed to get um, positive clones. Yeah, yeah, John, that's tough. Um, so looking back, then, uh, what did you learn from this project? And would you use the the fast HDR again for other kinds of projects in the future? And uh, what kinds of projects would you use it for? Yeah, so. Would we use the uh, fast HDR technology and Express Cells team again? Absolutely, um, and and we actually had um, before Abex was acquired, we had developed a couple um, additional projects, um, and then the acquisition happened. And and you know I'm no longer affiliated with with the company. Um, 
as it's now part of uh, BI. Um, but yes, we would we would we would work with uh, Express Sales again. Um, as I said, the team's terrific to work with. Um, excellent customer service, and we like the fact that their scientists uh, worked with us uh, to provide alternative strategies to make the the project work out. Um, it, one of the projects that we we thought about, we we thought, well, let's take a step or two back from what we had originally planned to do uh, when we set out on this first project. And you know, again, taking the the advice, the recommendations from um, Express Sales, what we would do next would be to use um, work with a number of cell lines that they have done a lot of work. Um, you know, in the past with, um, these would be cell lines that um, they have very high um, transfection efficiency. Um, they replicate, you know, they double within a day or less. So they're fast growing cells. Um, and, and the approach that we would take would be um, different. Instead of trying to be very, um, uh, create a more of a sophisticated knock-in we would take cell lines that that have these, you know, these that 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 the Express teams has, has worked uh, has worked with in the past, and we would introduce the entire um, gene. So we would create cell lines that have the HLA allele of interest, that and then that we would then knock in the antigen G um, as well, and then we could act knock in a, a mutated form of antigen G. And and so that would be probably a more straight uh, approach than the the, the original uh, uh, strategy we had. So there are ways to to work around uh, some of the challenges we faced. And I think with the starting with some of the other cell lines um, that that um, that the Express Sales team has had a lot of experience with and has sort of the characteristics that make for. Um, a better likelihood to have a successful uh, project. Uh, I think we we would want to do it all over again with them. So, great answer. Well, uh, f thanks so much for the insights, John. I think that's all uh, for the questions we had planned. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, Liam. Appreciate it. Yep, um, my pleasure. So now on to a few questions for the audience. Uh, we'll now be moving on to the Q and A. And uh, so we'll just switch over to there now. Fantastic. All right. Uh, well, big thanks to John and Oscar for the insight so far. So let's just kick things off with a great question here. Uh, how do you prevent the labeling tag from interfering with the function of the targeted protein? Hi, that's a, that's a good question. So basically what we have done in the FASTGR system to prevent that to happen is we have a flexible linker that uh, basically allow the two proteins to form their natural 3D structure. And this uh, flexible linker basically will prevent as much as possible, uh, you know, one protein interfering with the function of the other. And we can do that either if we select the C-terminal tagging or N-terminal tagging. Fantastic. Um, another one here, and, and John, uh, this one is directed towards you. Um, somebody said that they're surprised they never, we never asked you uh, what was done after electroporation and lip, uh, lipofection were both inefficient. Uh, was this problem ever, ever solved and how? Yeah, um, well, we, we had several uh, meetings after, after the um, first set of results came in and, and you know, basically we, because they tried multiple times over um, uh, with both electroporation and lip affection, the results were basically the same, very poor uh, rates of, of, of gene delivery. We, we decided to um, table the, the project at that time and, and then come back with sort of the next plans. What could we do? So, so we really never solved that particular issue regarding um, efficiency of, of transfection um, with those different, with the three cell lines that we started with. Yeah, good point. It's a, definitely a very challenging project to shoot for. Yes. Um, all right, Oscar, I'll direct this next one to you. Uh, so what 
types of cell lines have uh, you been able to modify with the fast HDR system? Um, we have been able to modify uh, mostly um, a big, big um, number of cancer cell lines, including um, adherence cell lines, uh, suspension cell lines. We have also done not only human cell lines, but we have done mouse, um, hamster cell lines. So basically, uh, as long as um, you know the cell line can grow well, uh, divide, uh, you know, preferably every cycle less than 30 hours. Um, a cell model that can be electroporated or transfected, uh, the, the method should work in, in pretty much any, any mammalian system. Fantastic, great answer. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll just make this next question the last one, and I think it'd be great to get uh, maybe both of your inputs on it. Uh, but how would you uh, handle a very low expression, uh, very low expressing protein? Um, so that's a really good question. So uh, we have developed some models where we um, are asked to target uh, a very low expressing protein. And one way to solve that is, for example, if your protein happened to be stimulated by some kind of treatment, during the selection process, you can put a stimulant there. So imagine that there is a compound or there is some kind of a, a manipulation in the in the cell culture that you can do to the cell to express to bump up the expression of that protein during the selection process that can help you um, select the the protein that so that's that's one one approach um, another approach that um, we can you know try as well but that require modification of the vector is um, you can theoretically include a promoter an artificial promoter just to drive the expression of a, a antibiotic selection uh, gene but then basically that one um, will uh, reduce the chance of uh, getting, you know, all the cells 100% positive when you do the selection because there could be cells that have the, you know, the plasmid, but the plasmid was not integrated. And when you start selection too early, that may give you, you know, false positives. Yeah, very good point. Um, and John, what about you? How would you, how might you handle that? Yeah, I mean, many of the, proteins that that my group um, studies uh, they, they are low expressing proteins and so we do have to treat cells for a number of hours generally overnight with different types of cytokines to get the expression level of those proteins um, increased all right fantastic great answers both um, yeah so again thanks so much for sharing your insights today it's really been a pleasure having you both with, uh, with us thank you Thank you. Uh, big thanks also to the audience here for participating. Uh, and last but not least, we'd like to thank uh, Express Cells for sponsoring this event. So in closing, we hope you enjoyed this scientist.com and Inside Scientific webinar, and we'll see you again next time. Have a great day, everyone.